O.J. Simpson was a famous football player who also became very popular in movies, TV, and commercials. He was famous for being found not guilty in the trial for the murder of his ex-wife and her friend in 1995 in Los Angeles, a trial that everyone in the country watched. He passed away at his home in Las Vegas when he was 76, and his family said he died of cancer. Even though he was found not guilty in the murder trial, that event changed his life forever. In 1997, another court case decided he was responsible for the deaths and had to pay a lot of money to the victim's families, but he hardly paid any of it. He tried to live a new life, take care of his kids, and stay out of trouble. He wrote a book where he talked about the murders as if they were just a theory, which made a lot of people angry. The family of one of the victims took over the book, added their thoughts, and published it. In 2007, Simpson got into trouble again when he and some friends forcefully took some sports items from a hotel room in Las Vegas, claiming they were stolen from him. The next year, he was found guilty of many crimes, including robbery and kidnapping, and was sent to jail for a long time. But he got out in 2017 after serving the shortest possible time. O.J. Simpson's story is still talked about a lot because it brings up many big issues like justice, race, and what it means to be famous in America. His life story is very dramatic, from being a poor kid with health problems to becoming a star athlete and then being involved in big legal problems. I've always been a runner, O.J. Simpson said back in 1975. At that time, he was very famous and made a lot of money as a football player for the Buffalo Bills. He was incredibly good at running with the ball, which earned him the nickname The Juice. He started his running career in college at the University of Southern California, then went on to play in the National Football League NFL for 11 years. Besides football, he also ran towards success in movies, TV, and advertising, working with big names in Hollywood and on Madison Avenue. Simpson set many records in both college and professional football, won the Heisman Trophy, and got into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He was in lots of movies and TV ads, especially for Hertz, and he was a sports commentator for ABC and NBC. He had a nice family, fancy houses and cars, and he was looked up to by many Americans as a charming and talented man. He also enjoyed playing golf. However, his life wasn't all perfect. He faced serious personal problems, like the tragic death of his infant daughter in their pool and his divorce from his high school love. His second marriage, to a young woman named Nicole, was very troubled. He often got violent with her, leading to many calls to the police. Despite the frequent violence, the police usually didn't do much about it. In one incident on New Year's Day 1989, the police found Nicole badly injured and hiding outside their house. She was scared for her life. Simpson was arrested and found guilty of hurting her but he only got a fine and probation. They divorced in 1992, but the problems didn't stop. In 1993, Nicole called 911 again because he had returned to her place, showing that their issues were far from over. On June 12, 1994, something terrible happened. Nicole Simpson, who was 35, and Ronald Goldman, who was 25, were brutally attacked outside Nicole's home in the Brentwood area of Los Angeles, not too far from where O.J. Simpson lived. Nicole was severely injured, and Ronald was killed. The police couldn't find the weapon, but they found a bloody glove at the place where it happened, along with a lot of hair, blood, and other clues. Because of O.J. Simpson's history of violence against Nicole and her many calls to the police, the investigators quickly thought that O.J., who was 46 at the time, was responsible for the crime. They found blood on his car and inside his house. They found another bloody glove that matched the one found at the crime scene. They didn't think anyone else could have done it. Five days after the murder, right after he went to Nicole's funeral with their kids, O.J. Simpson was charged with the murder. But instead of staying, he ran away in his white Ford Bronco, driven by his friend Al Cowlings. O.J. was in the back, holding a gun and threatening to hurt himself. They led the police and news helicopters on a slow chase that was shown on TV all over Southern California. This chase was so big that TV networks stopped their regular shows to broadcast it, and 95 million people watched it live. Many people stood on bridges and roadsides to watch as the Bronco went by, with some cheering and waving. The police had to close highways, and cars stopped to see. Eventually, O.J. Simpson went back home, and the police arrested him. The trial that followed lasted nine months, from January to October 1995. It was a major event, with detailed stories about the murder and the legal strategies used by the prosecutors and O.J. Simpson's defense team, which had famous lawyers like Johnny Cochran, F. Lee Bailey, Alan Dershowitz, Barry Sheck, and Robert Shapiro. 
The prosecutors, Marsha Clark and Christopher A. Darden, presented a lot of evidence. They showed that the blood, shoe prints, hairs, shirt fibers, and carpet threads at the murder scene matched O.J. Simpson or his home. DNA tests also showed that a bloody glove found at Simpson's house was like the one found at the scene of the crime. They brought up 62 times when Simpson had been abusive to his wife. However, as the trial went on in front of Judge Lance Ito and a jury with 10 black members, it was clear there were problems with how the police had investigated. Some photos that could have been used as evidence were either lost or labeled wrong. The way the DNA was collected and kept wasn't done correctly, which made people think it might have been messed with. Detective Mark Foreman, an important witness, admitted he had gone into Simpson's house and found the matching glove and other key evidence without a legal search warrant. The defense suggested that Foreman might have placed the glove there on purpose, but they couldn't prove it. What really hurt the case, though, was how the defense showed Furman had a history of making racist comments. Although Furman claimed he hadn't made any racist remarks for 10 years, four witnesses and a recorded interview played during the trial proved he was lying, which made him less believable. After the trial, Furman faced charges for lying under oath and was found guilty, making him the only person convicted in this whole situation. A big mistake happened during the trial when the prosecution asked Simpson to put on the gloves found with the crime evidence. Simpson struggled to put them on because they seemed too small for his hands. In the end, the defense was able to create enough doubt with their arguments. They claimed that the Los Angeles police were biased, suggesting that Simpson was unfairly targeted because he was black, and asked the jury to consider this trial as a statement against a racist system. On the day the verdict was to be announced, the courthouse was surrounded by fans looking for autographs, people selling t-shirts, street preachers, and photographers. This trial, often called the trial of the century, had 126 witnesses, won 105 pieces of evidence, and produced 45,000 pages of transcript. After being isolated from the outside world for 266 days, the longest in California's history, the jury took only three hours to make their decision. When the verdict was announced, America almost seemed to freeze. Everyone, whether at home, work, airports, or shopping centers, stopped to watch the outcome. Even President Bill Clinton stepped out of the Oval Office to see what would happen. In the courtroom, there were loud reactions. Some people cheered with joy while others expressed shock and dismay. The verdict brought happiness to many black Americans, but left many white Americans in disbelief. Following the trial, O.J. Simpson and the entire case became a hot topic for TV specials, movies, and over 30 books, with many of those involved in the trial writing their own accounts and earning millions from them. Simpson, with Lawrence Schiller, released a book called I Want to Tell You, filled with letters, photos, and his side of the story, which sold many copies and made him over a million dollars. After spending 474 days locked up, Simpson was free again, but his troubles weren't over. The Goldman and Brown families sued him in a civil court, where a mostly white jury found him responsible for the deaths and ordered him to pay $33.5 million in damages. This civil trial, which avoided discussing racial matters, was somewhat of a win for the families, but a setback for Simpson, who claimed he could never pay the full amount. Simpson, who had used a lot of his money on his criminal defense, was thought to have had around $11 million before the trial, but was left with about $3.5 million afterwards. An auction of his belongings, including his Heisman Trophy, raised about $500,000, which went to the victim's families, but he still owed a lot more. He got back custody of his children with Nicole Simpson and moved to Florida in 2000, where he led a quieter life, playing golf and living on his pensions, which totaled about $400,000 a year. Florida Laos protected his home and pension from being taken to pay the court damages. Simpson's life was no longer as glamorous or profitable, but he managed to send his kids to good schools and live a somewhat normal life, occasionally being seen in public and giving autographs. He faced minor legal issues, like being fined for speeding in a protected area for manatees and for stealing cable TV services. In 2006, as the money he owed to the victim's families increased to $38 million, Fred Goldman, Ronald Goldman's father, sued Simpson, claiming he tried to avoid paying the damages through his book and TV deal for If I Did It, although the project was canceled and Simpson didn't have to return the 800 Susan's advance, the Goldman family eventually published the book, emphasizing Simpson's guilt on the cover. 
Despite being seen as guilty by many in the public eye, Simpson was in court again in 2008, accused of breaking into a Las Vegas hotel room with others to steal sports memorabilia. He was found guilty of this crime. O.J. Simpson said he was just trying to get back his own things that were stolen from him, like some footballs, awards, and a photo with the FBI director J. Edgar Hoover, and he claimed he didn't know anything about guns being there. However, four men who were arrested with him and admitted their guilt in court said differently with two of them testifying they had guns because Simpson asked them to. The prosecution also used recordings secretly made by one of the people involved that went into detail about how they planned and did the robbery. On October 3rd, exactly 13 years after he was found not guilty of murder in Los Angeles, a jury with nine women and three men found Simpson guilty of many serious crimes, including armed robbery and kidnapping. Simpson was given a sentence that meant he had to stay in prison for at least nine years. His lawyer promised to appeal, pointing out that there were no black jurors and questioning if the trial was fair, considering Simpson's past. However, the jurors stated that they didn't talk about the murder case during their discussions. In 2013, the parole board in Nevada noticed Simpson had behaved well in prison and took part in programs for inmates, so they let him out on parole for some of the charges, but not all. Simpson asked for a new trial, but a judge in Nevada said no, and experts thought it was unlikely that an appeal would work. He stayed in prison until October 1, 2017, when he was released on parole. Simpson had certain rules to follow while on parole, like not traveling too much, avoiding contact with the other people involved in the robbery, and not drinking too much until 2021 when these conditions were removed and he became completely free. There were still people who wondered if Simpson was really guilty of killing his ex-wife and Mr. Goldman. In 2008, Mike Gilbert, who used to work with Simpson selling memorabilia, wrote a book saying Simpson, while under the influence of marijuana, confessed to the murders to him. Gilbert claimed Simpson said he didn't bring a knife, but used one that Nicole Simpson had, and also stopped taking his arthritis medicine so his hands would swell and not fit the gloves during the trial. Simpson's lawyer, Yale L. Gallanter, denied these accusations, calling Gilbert delusional. In 2016, the O.J. Simpson story was revisited in two major TV productions, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, part of the American Crime Story series on FX, and O.J. Made in America, a lengthy documentary by ESPN, both retold the tale, focusing on the trial and the broader context of race, fame, sports, and life in Los Angeles. These shows were highly praised and reignited interest in Simpson's story. Orenthal James Simpson, who became the top pick in the 1969 NFL Draft, was born on July 9, 1947, in San Francisco, into a family with three siblings. As a young boy, he dealt with rickets, a condition that required him to wear braces on his legs, but he eventually overcame this. His dad, who worked as a janitor and cook, left when O.J. was just four years old, so his mom, a nurse's aide, raised him and his siblings in a challenging area of San Francisco. As a young teen, O.J. Simpson, who didn't like his first name Orenthal, was part of street gangs. However, everything changed when he was 15 and met Willie Mays, a famous baseball player for the San Francisco Giants. This meeting inspired him a lot. He then started playing football at Galileo High School and became really good in his last year there. In 1967, O.J. married Marguerite Whitley, his high school girlfriend. They had three kids together, Arnell, Jason, and Aaron. Sadly, after they split up in 1979, their youngest child, Aaron, drowned in their pool at just 23 months old. O.J. married Nicole Brown in 1985, and they had two children, Sydney and Justin. He has four living children, Arnell, Jason, Sydney, and Justin, and also three grandchildren, as shared by his lawyer, Malcolm P. Laverne. After getting out of prison in Nevada in 2017, O.J. moved into a friend's house in a Las Vegas country club area, planning to stay just for a while. But he liked the golf there and the new friends he met, often at restaurants, so he decided to stay in Las Vegas permanently. He lived in a house on the Rhodes Ranch Golf Club course until he passed away. O.J. Simpson was amazing at football from a young age, he was very fast and strong, which made him difficult to stop or catch on the field. He first played college football at San Francisco City College, where he scored 54 touchdowns in just two years. 
Then he moved to the University of Southern California, USC, where he broke records by running for 3,423 yards and scoring 36 touchdowns in 22 games, leading his team to the Rose Bowl twice. He won the Heisman Trophy in 1968, awarded to the best college football player, and was often called the best college running back ever. His professional football career was even more impressive. Drafted first in 1969 by the Buffalo Bills, he didn't play much at first and even got injured in his second year. But by 1971, he started to shine, helped by his team's offensive line called the Electric Company, because they turned on the juice. In 1973, OJ broke a big record by rushing over 2,000 yards in one season, earning the title of the NFL's most valuable player. By 1975, he was leading in rushing yards and scores in the American Football Conference. After nine seasons with the Bills, he played for two years with the San Francisco 49ers, his hometown team, before retiring in 1979 as the league's highest paid player. His professional stats include 61 touchdowns and more than 11,000 rushing yards. He was honored with an induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1985. Alongside football, O.J. Simpson also worked as a sports analyst on TV, covering games for ABC and then NBC. He even returned to ABC to work on Monday Night Football. O.J. also acted in movies and TV shows. He appeared in around 30 movies, including The Towering Inferno, Killer Force, Cassandra Crossing, and Capricorn One, as well as the comedy The Naked Gun series. He knew he wasn't a serious actor, joking that no matter how much he tried, people wouldn't see him playing serious roles like Othello. O.J. Simpson was known for being friendly and approachable. He often chatted with reporters and fans, signed autographs, took photos with kids, and was modest during interviews, always praising his team and coaches who seemed to really like him. During a time when many were showing support for black power, Simpson was known more for his tough playing on the football field than for political statements. His cheerful and approachable image, along with his popularity, made him an ideal person for companies to hire for their advertisements. Even before he started playing in the NFL, he had signed endorsement deals, like a three-year contract with Chevrolet worth $250,000. Later on, he promoted various products, including sports gear, soft drinks, and razors. In 1975, Hertz, the car rental company, chose him to be the first black person to lead a national TV ad campaign. The commercials, which showed him running through airports and jumping over counters to reach a Hertz car, became very famous. These ads increased Hertz's business significantly and made OJ's face one of the most well-known in the country. Simpson seemed to say goodbye in a note on the day he was arrested while in the Bronco, threatening to harm himself. His friend Robert Kardashian shared a letter OJ had written, where he expressed his love for Nicole and denied being responsible for her death. In the letter, he asked people not to pity him, saying he had lived a great life with wonderful friends and urged them to remember the good side of him, not the troubled person he had become. 